All right, brethren, let's ask God's help in this, our last session of this unit of our study together. Our Father, we find it no burden to be obedient to your gracious command to come before your presence with thanksgiving and to enter into your gates and into your courts with praise. You have been gracious to us in these days together, and we are deeply grateful. We thank you for the help given to our brother Dan in the technical matters. We thank you for being with us, that we have enjoyed open-faced, warm fellowship one with another. There's been no tension and outbreaking of carnality. Thank you for the help given to your servant. And now we look to you to crown our time together with your special grace and presence resting upon us. Hear us, we plead, and receive our thanks as we offer both our petitions and our praise through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, we began in the last hour, brethren, to consider this weighty subject of doing the work of an evangelist in all of our pastoral preaching. I first of all sought to establish the duty and privilege of doing this work. Secondly, I set before you what I called the duty and privilege fulfilled. And then I offered some practical suggestions relative to this duty and privilege. In this hour, I want to address one more aspect of this weighty ministerial duty and privilege, and it is that of the disposition that is essential to the fulfilling of this duty and privilege. If we are to fulfill our duty of being those who do the work of an evangelist, I want to set before you what I believe is critical, and that is that there is a certain disposition that must mark us as men of God in the fulfilling of that duty. I begin with definition. The word disposition refers to the prevailing frame of mind and spirit, the dominant attitude of the soul. Webster defines disposition as, quote, one's customary frame of mind. For way of illustration, we commonly speak of people in terms of their differing or dominant dispositions. We speak of one person as having a sullen disposition. We speak of another person as having a cheerful disposition of another. We may use the word generous or the word sweet. However, in each case, when we use it, we are attempting to describe what is the prevailing evident disposition, the frame of mind or spirit, the dominant attitude and characteristic of an individual as it is manifested in discernible ways. So we're going to talk about the disposition, the dominant attitude of the soul that ought to be evident in the one who would do the work of an evangelist, and here I'm using the term not concerning someone who may call himself an evangelist and go from church to church and preach particularly to the unconverted, but I'm talking of the pastor as he seeks within his other pastoral responsibilities as a shepherd of God's people to fulfill that mandate of doing the work of an evangelist. And then by way of introduction, I also want to say something about the importance of this issue. Having focused your attention upon the precise issue that is before us as conveyed by the definition given, I want to proceed in opening up the subject by asserting that preaching involves the engagement of the entirety of one's redeemed humanity. In proclaiming the message of God's saving mercy to sinners, next to the content of the message conveyed, few things are of greater importance than the disposition out of which the man of God conveys that message of God's controversy with sinners 
and his appointed way of extending mercy to those sinners in the gospel, assuming that the content of the message is accurate, that it is full of Christ and him crucified and exalted, assuming that the form and the substance of the sermon are reasonably clear and essentially biblical, then perhaps it's accurate to say that nothing, nothing is of greater importance than the disposition with which that message is conveyed to one's hearers, particularly in its evangelistic thrusts and concentrated addresses to the minds and hearts of the unconverted. It is this matter of the disposition of the evangelist that will influence in great measure the full range of the various elements of a preacher's redeemed humanity which are involved in the act of preaching. From the choice of vocabulary, the modulation of his voice, to the emotional energy expressed in his eye and his entire range of the physical action while he's preaching, it is the preacher's disposition that will give flavor, smell, and a cast, a distinctive hue over the entire sermon, especially that part of the sermon in which he's seeking to do the work of an evangelist. So I propose to carry out this theme of the disposition of the evangelist into seven, several avenues of concern. And since the disposition is not simple, but manifold and complex, we could entitle this lecture slash sermon, The Manifold Dispositional Complex of the Evangelist. And I'll attempt to open up this subject under four headings. The first of them is this, the disposition of the evangelist in relationship to the message that he conveys. What ought to mark the prevailing state of the soul of the preacher with respect to the message itself when the great issues of the law and the gospel, the great issues of Christ and him crucified are being proclaimed? What things ought to characterize the conscious sensibilities of the heart, the soul, the mind of the preacher in relationship to the truths that he is preaching. And I would assert that there are at least three things that ought to be present as the prevailing disposition of the soul of the preacher with respect to the message being conveyed. Number one, first of all and foundational to all else, the preacher ought to have a burning conviction as to the objective reality of the truths he is conveying. In 1 John 1, 1 to 3, John writes, That which we have seen, that which we have heard, and our hands have handled of the word of life, what we have seen we declare unto you. And though that is unique, in the apostolic experience, surely there's a vital principle wrapped up in these words. John wrote and indicated that he was not dabbling in speculations concerning the vital issues in his letter. Likewise, if we're to do the work of an evangelist with any conviction whatsoever, we must be persuaded that the truths in which we traffic are indeed objective eternal, changeless realities. Paul could say in Galatians chapter 1 with regard to his message, verses 11 and 12, I make known to you, brethren, is touching the gospel which was preached by me, that it is not after man, for neither did I receive it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came to me through revelation of Jesus Christ. A unique Pauline apostolic experience. However, again, the principle is this. This same Paul writes to Timothy, and he says to Timothy, Hold the pattern of sound words which you have received of me 
And then he tells him in his second letter, chapter 3, in verse 14, continue with these things, knowing of whom you have learned them, not directly from Christ, as Paul received them, but from your grandmother and your mother. But he says, hold them with the conviction that they are absolute truth. And brethren, we need to press a very searching question upon our consciences. And the question is this. Have we been swept along and caught up in the rising tide of biblical and reformed thinking? And thereby we have received things, as it were, from men? Or have these truths been written upon our hearts by the finger of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit? So that when we preach the nerve centers of the gospel, is it out of that deep, burning conviction of truth that has been inwrought to the texture of our souls by the power of the Holy Spirit. In that marvelous sermon of B.B. Warfield on 2 Corinthians 4.13, where Paul says, I believed and therefore did I speak. We also believe and therefore we speak. He underscores this tremendous principle that if indeed the Holy Spirit has taught us these truths of the gospel, no matter how offensive they may be, no matter how unpopular they may be, if we believe them, we cannot but speak them. And it's a powerful sermon, and his peroration is, is uh, goosebump-making, and I commend it to you. I've given you one part in the quote that is before you, but if we're going to do the work of an evangelist with regard to our relationship to the truths that comprise an effort to overcome ignorance and indifference concerning the law and the gospel, the preacher must have a burning conviction as to the objective reality of the truths he's conveying. But secondly, our disposition with relationship to the truth should be one of feeling present pressure in our hearts as to the immediate and urgent relevance of the truths we conveyed. It's one thing to believe, yes, this is true truth. It's another thing to believe and to feel present pressure on our hearts as to the immediate and urgent relevance of the truth being conveyed. And surely that's what comes through in 2 Corinthians 5, 20 to 6, 2, where Paul moves from the heart of what the gospel of reconciliation is to those well-known words, behold, he starts evangelizing a church to which he's already written, to which he's preached, and through whom that church was formed like they're a bunch of sinners. He says, behold, today is the day of salvation. Now is the time of salvation. That is always amazing to me. It's though he almost forgot who he's writing to because he felt a present pressure upon his spirit with respect to the urgent relevance of the truths conveyed. If we believe John 3.36, that he that believes has life, he that believes not, the wrath of God abides, present tense, abides upon him. And we have no assurance that men will ever hear again these truths. There will be within our breasts something of that present pressure upon our hearts of the immediate and urgent relevance of the truths we are conveying. Let me illustrate. There's all the difference in the world between a man sitting in his neighbor's living room. This man happens to be an insurance salesman. And he's sitting in his neighbor's living room discussing the availability and the desirability of fire insurance. And he's seeking to persuade his neighbor that he ought to obtain some. However, two days after that encounter, this insurance salesman who lives next door to his client smells something and throwing open his window, he sees something. His neighbor's house is on fire. 
Now he goes to his neighbor, no longer in a relaxed, low-key setting, attempting to sell a product. He's marshalling all of his powers to warn his neighbor to flee from a deadly danger. In the first case, he was attempting to sell a commodity in the face of a possible calamity. In the second case, he's seeking to persuade his neighbor to action in the face of an immediate life-threatening danger. God have mercy when we convey the gospel like a salesman talking about something to do with a potential danger and entreat men with the persuasion they are in immediate danger. To change the imagery, if we really believe that there's a cloud of divine anger hanging over the head of our unconverted hearers and that neither we nor they know when that cloud might burst, surely we will feel something of this present pressure concerning the immediate necessity of the truths we are conveying when we are preaching the gospel. And it's a, it's a very soul-distressing thing to realize that the more we plead passionately and earnestly, feeling the pressure of those truths upon our own hearts and people sit unmoved, we may be literally making hell all the hotter for people. Few things have caused me to consider leaving the ministry. That's one of them. That I may be an instrument simply with people to make hell all the more miserable for them. But what else can you do? What else can you do? You've got to live with that potential liability if you're going to be true to their souls. And again, I commend to you that quote from Gardner's Spring that underscores this second point. But in the third place, the disposition we should have with respect to the message we convey is one of an assured sense of the ultimate authority behind the truths conveyed and our position in conveying them. That's critical, that when I announce the inflexibility of the law, the spiritual nature of the law, that I do this in the name and in the authority of the God who gave the law. And when I announce the doctrinal content and the divine imperatives and the inevitable fruits of the gospel, I must do so with a disposition marked by this assured sense of the ultimate authority behind those truths conveyed and my position in conveying them. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 20, we then, and I don't think that's applying to believers in general, the we in that context is Paul and his ministering companions. We then are ambassadors for Christ as though we beseeched you. You see, the you was the Corinthians, and it disturbs me when people take that text and say, every Christian's an ambassador for Christ. That's not true. That's not the context. That doesn't fit the analogy of Scripture. We who have been set apart by the living Christ for special service in His church, we then are ambassadors for Christ. Now notice the language, as though God were beseeching through us, we beseech you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. And when we have that consciousness that in spite of our sin, in spite of our failures, in spite of a thousand ineptitudes, against all reasonable causes, God has chosen to place us in the ministry. Christ has given us to his church that we stand with that authority of a herald of the king. There's a beautiful, beautiful example. I skip over that first quote of Gardner Spring uh, to share this incident. He tells about uh, the principal, I uh, shouldn't say the principal, the president of uh, Princeton Seminary, uh, Davies, who was at the time, I believe, only 34 years of age. 
and he had the opportunity to go and to speak to the King of England. And now listen to these words. That distinguished American preacher Samuel Davies, then president of the College of New Jersey, when on a visit to England in behalf of the college, was invited to preach before King George III. His youthful queen was sitting by his side, and so enchanted were they by the preacher's eloquence that the king expressed his admiration in no measured terms, and so audibly and rudely as to draw the attention of the audience and to interrupt the service. The preacher made a sudden and solemn pause in his discourse, looked round upon the audience, and fixing his piercing eye upon England's noisy monarch said, quote, When the lion roars, the beast of the forest tremble. When Jehovah speaks, let the kings of the earth keep silence before him, end quote. He was God's messenger. He feared not man who is a worm. It's not God's ministers who tremble amid such scenes. Well, I've never preached before a king, but I was preaching some years ago at a Christian college, and they had a very preachable auditorium. It had angled theater-type seats. And when I stood up to preach, there was a young woman on the back row preening her hair. So I said, well, I'll start in and see how we do, if I can catch her ears and cause her to put down her comb or brush, whatever it was. Didn't work. I kept preaching. She kept preening. And I finally turned and not looking at her, I had a practice of doing this. I said, now, I don't have the attention of one or two of you. I'm not here on a fool's errand. Please give me your attention. I turned back. She kept preening. I looked up. And I called a young woman, something of that effect. This is the word of God, and I demand that you hear the message of my king. Well, afterwards, some young smart aleck came up to me. Mr. Martin, who in the world do you think you are to demand a hearing? I said, son, it isn't who I think I am. It's who I know I am. I'm a messenger of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and I demand a hearing for the message of my king. Well, it shut the mouth of the young smart aleck. But that was true. That's the only reason I would do that. That sense that we must bring home afresh when I am calling upon sinners and bringing them to the bar of God's judgment, I do so as God's ambassador the Kerux was to deliver the message of the king. His Kerus, uh, his Keruso, his proclamation was the proclamation the king has said. And the Kerugma, the message, was the king's message, not his. And the disposition that we must have in being evangelist is one that should be marked by that sense of the authority, not only of the truth itself, but the position in which we convey that truth. By prayer, by meditation, by holy soliloquy, the preacher must bring himself to this frame of mind and heart if indeed the elements of impassioned evangelistic proclamation and impassioned pleading are once again to be known among us with power. Now we move on to consider together our second major division in the lecture, namely the disposition of the evangelist, now not in relationship to the truth, but in relationship to the magnitude of his task. And here our basic text is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 and through 3. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I was determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. You see the drift of the apostles' words in this portion of the Word of God. When he came to Corinth, he felt inadequate, something akin to dread. 
I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. It indicates a deep, serious sense of weakness and fear. Now, what was the cause of this state of mind, of this disposition of weakness and fear? Well, I think it's easy to say what it was not. It was certainly not the fear of man. We read Galatians 1.10, he says, If I should yet fear men, I should not be the servant of God. 1 Thessalonians 2.4, he says, I was not at all under the grip of the fear of man. Acts 20.24, I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you. So he wasn't trembling for fear of men. Secondly, it was not uncertainty as to the content of his message. We read Galatians 1, 10 to 12. His message was given by direct revelation. He was confident of the source and the content of his message. And thirdly, it certainly was not inexperience in preaching. Read the account of how much experience he had prior to Acts 18 when he came to Corinth that records his visit to Corinth. So he said, I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. It wasn't fear of man. It wasn't uncertainty of his message. It wasn't inexperience. Fourthly, it wasn't any uncertainty as to his call to the apostolic office and the preaching ministry. No, he vividly remembered. He was commissioned directly by the risen Christ, Acts 26, 18, and the other accounts of his conversion and, and his commission. And fifthly, it was not apprehension concerning his success in the eyes and judgment of men. He could say, it's a very little thing with me if I be judged of you or of men's judgment, 1 Corinthians 4, 3. Rather, I will assert that this sense of fear and trembling was rooted in a present, intelligent, and deeply held conviction concerning the real factors involved in preaching the gospel to dead sinners. What were these perspectives and convictions that did indeed produce this disposition of fear and of trembling? that lay at the heart of Paul's dispositional complex. Well, let me suggest several things. Number one, there was Paul's conviction regarding the fact that the God of this world has truly blinded men's minds to the truth of the gospel. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, Paul makes it very clear how he viewed natural men. If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled in them that are perishing, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. Paul was made aware from his very conversion and initial commissioning that the gospel labors involve nothing less than turning men from darkness to light from the power of Satan unto God, Acts 26 and 18. Paul knew and firmly believed that men were really spiritually blind, that the lenses of their spiritual eyes were clouded with impenetrable cataracts, that their spiritual retinas were detached throughout the whole back of the spiritual eyeball, and their spiritual optic nerves were dead. He knew that no mere glasses or contact lenses of clever words could give men sight. Only a divinely creative miracle could open the eyes of the blind. He felt that. He believed that. He knew that. Secondly, Paul was a realist with regard to the deeply embedded prejudice of both Jew and Greek towards the heart of the gospel message, namely, Jesus Christ and him is crucified. 1 Corinthians 1.18, the word of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Verses 23 and 24, the Jews, they know what kind of gospel they want. He says, the Greeks, I knew what kind of gospel they want, and I didn't kowtow to either Jew or Greek. My message, I knew, was nothing but a mass of offensive propositional truth concerning a crucified Messiah in whom is the deposit of all the wisdom of God. 
And the Greek would laugh and sneer, and the Jew would curse and desire to stone me. I was with you in weakness and fear and trembling because I knew I was coming to blinded men. I knew I was coming to people deeply prejudiced against my message across the whole spectrum of ethnic and religious backgrounds. Thirdly, the apostle was a realist with respect to his own condition. He said, we have the treasure in clay pots. We have the treasure, yes, the treasure of the gospel of new covenant blessing, but it's deposited in clay pots that are cracked in places, clay pots that are fragile. He knew himself to be a clay pot, and this contributed to the fear and the trembling. And furthermore, this fear and trembling, I believe, was rooted in the recognition and conviction that the facility of utterance was a divine gift that could be given or withheld according to divine sovereignty. So when he writes to the Ephesians and says, with all prayer and supplication, watching and praying at all times for all the saints and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly and speak as I ought to speak. That's an amazing statement to me. As often as he had preached, he said, you Ephesians, pray for me, that I may be given utterance. I don't carry it in my back pocket or carry it in my previous experience. I need desperately a present, immediate enablement of the Spirit of God. Will God give it to me or will he not? I was with you in weakness and fear, and in much trembling. And finally, this disposition had taproots in the awareness that he was accountable to God, particularly in his role as a faithful watchman. Acts 20 and verse 26, I take you to record I'm pure from the blood of all men. Language taken from Ezekiel and the watchman motif in 2 Corinthians 5, 10 and 11, we must all be made manifest before the judgment seat of Christ, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now, bring those five things together. And what will they produce in a man of God who faces the task of bringing the everlasting gospel to perishing sinners? I say it will produce something similar to, if not a replication, of the fear and trembling of which the Apostle writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I have shocked many a young preacher when I've been in the church where he labors for ministry. And before I went out into the pulpit, he would ask a question like, some, how are you doing, Pastor Martin? And times without number, I've shocked them, but it's true by saying, each time is like the first time. Each time is like the first time. The thing I most need, I can't bring. God must give it. And I'll be facing people who are blind, and who are dead, and who are prejudiced. And my words have no more power to remove the blindness or the prejudice than they do to create a new world. And you go in weakness and in fear and with an inner trembling. And the acid test as to whether or not this disposition of fear and trembling is operative in our hearts will always be, number one, our prayerfulness. Both before, during, and after we've preached, if we really believe the words of Jesus, without me you can do nothing, nada, zilch, zero, then surely earnest prayer for the assistance and power of the Spirit will be inevitable. The instinctive activity of felt helplessness is earnest prayer. The instinctive activity of felt helplessness is earnest prayer. Secondly, our willingness to submit to every discipline that will bring us to a conscious sense of our weakness we will embrace. That's 2 Corinthians 12, 9 to 10. Once Paul understood the rationale 
behind God not answering his prayer regarding his thorn in the flesh, which made him consciously weak, he was saying, God, take this thing away. I cannot serve you to the full with this thorn. Take this thing away. God says, no, Paul, there's another explanation. Without that thorn, you're going to fall before the sin of pride. I can use a weak man, but I can't use a proud man. I resist the proud. Once Paul got that message, he said, Most gladly, most gladly, therefore, I will what? Glory in my infirmities. I read that and I say, Lord, I'm submissively embracing and tolerating two dead ears. I can't say I've risen to gladly embracing yet. I'm praying that I'll come to that. Every day to be reminded every time I wake up, I've got to put my ears on or I'm in the land of the deaf. That's what God's done. And I believe I have the heart of a child submissive to my father, but I don't want mere submission. I want to be able to say, Lord, if this is one of the sacraments by which you'll keep me consciously dependent, may my glory in my dead ears. I ain't there yet, but by the grace of God, I want to be there. So that preaching the gospel in felt weakness will be able to say with Paul, and my speech and my preaching were not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That's what Paul was saying. He says, this thorn keeps me consciously weak that the power of Christ may literally intent itself over me and around me. And for that end, he embraces, and you and I will embrace whatever disciplines keep us consciously weak. And thirdly, our jealous guarding of God's glory, if we're given any measure of success in our endeavors, we'll find ourselves very much at home in 1 Corinthians 3, 5 to 8, neither is he that plants anything, neither he that waters, but God that gives the increase. When we have this disposition with respect to the message we convey, and then secondly, the magnitude of the task, when God gives blessing, the praise goes to him. But then thirdly, we come now to the disposition of the evangelist in relationship to the people to whom he's preaching. And it's perhaps here that most of us will be very conscious that there is probably the most work yet to be done in our efforts to preach the gospel to needy sinners if they are to in any way approximate a mirror image of how our Lord and his apostles preached the gospel then the following things must mark our dispositional complex in relationship to the people to whom we're preaching. Number one, our disposition with respect to the pitiable state of our unconverted hearers. Their pitiable state. Scripture makes clear that men and women in sin are indeed culpable, blameworthy, utterly inexcusable before God. Romans 3, 19 and 20. However, the scriptures make it plain that men and women in sin are to be pitied because of the condition they are in. Remember Paul's word to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, 24 to 26, the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle to all men in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him unto his will. People that are taken captive, led around by the nose by their captor, they're to be pitied. Titus 3, 2 and 3, another challenging passage where Paul says with respect to our disposition to those that we are seeking to win to Christ and to whom we are conveying the gospel. Titus chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. He says, We're to speak evil of no man, not to be contentious, but to be gentle, 
showing meekness to men. Why? For we also were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lust and pleasures, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God appeared, and then, of course, our Lord, looking upon the multitudes, he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. And it says he was moved with compassion. It's in the face of the pitiable state of the unconverted. There ought to be on our part a spirit of gentleness, of meekness and patience in dealing with them. Surely, this is something of the spirit that motivated our Lord while hanging upon the cross and moved him to pray, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Or the prophet Jeremiah, who bore patiently the opposition he received, and seldom, brethren, are sinners scolded, needled, or bullied into the kingdom. Seldom. Occasionally, God may use in his inscrutable sovereignty. But generally, men are not scolded, needled, or bullied into the kingdom. They enter the kingdom from the human standpoint when they are lovingly and tenderly warned, wooed, graciously entreated, and solemnly warned to flee from the wrath to come and to embrace the offered Savior and the salvation that awaits every believing sinner who flees to Christ. That should be our disposition with regard to their pitiable state. But secondly, there ought to be something of our disposition with respect to the dangerous state of our unconverted hearers. Scripture does emphasize again and again the reality of the danger of the unconverted. God says concerning them, you have set them in slippery places. And according to Romans 2, 5, every day finds them accumulating a greater measure of stored up wrath. And while the long suffering of God preserves and sustains them, they think God's long suffering is a kind of unprincipled indulgence that makes them all the more careless in their sin. They've heard gospel pleas, gospel warnings. God has struck them dead. God must be indulgent. That's the way they think. The danger of the unconverted is forcefully stated in such a text as Hebrews 10 and verse 31. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And in the face of such realities, brethren, we must have a spirit-wrought disposition of genuine fear for them. Fear that leads us to an earnest warning of them. Again, 2 Corinthians 5, 10 and 11, Acts 20, 31, Paul said, Day and night with tears, and our Lord weeping over Jerusalem, Luke 19, 41 and 42. And in addition for fearing for them, we must be moved to the place where we warn them of their danger. If we do not preach in such a way as to reflect a disposition moved to dread, fear, and grief at the reality of their dangerous state, what makes us think they will be moved to dread and to fear and to grief for their true condition? The problem with the unconverted is they don't really believe what God says concerning them. We must constantly ask ourselves the question, do we believe their condition is as dangerous as God says it is? But not only must my disposition with respect to their pitiable and dangerous state be commensurate with the reality of who and what they are, as unconverted sinners, but in the third place, let me say something concerning our disposition towards them with respect to their salvable state. Their salvable state. It's a wonderful thing that God has revealed to us in the Scriptures, the fact that He has an electing purpose. However, he has hidden from us who it is that he has placed within that gracious and sovereign choice of equally hell-deserving sinners. Therefore, 
We preach to men who are to be regarded as being in a salvable state unless they have committed blasphemy against the Holy Spirit or have sinned what John calls a sin unto death. And while we may have some serious reservations concerning certain sinners as to whether they may have crossed the line into a state of judicial hardness, as long as God gives them life and breath, we have no right to place them there. No right to place them there. While they live and breathe, they are in a salvable state while they live and breathe, and we must have a disposition that looks upon them and regards them in reality as being in such a state. All to whom we preach must be viewed as in that state, for we do not know who among them are God's elect. And when we believe this, a commensurate disposition is implanted in our hearts that we have a divine warrant to preach to all men as salvable. That doesn't undermine in any way our belief in and our unashamed proclamation of the definite design and purpose of God in election, or the fact that Christ has died to secure the salvation of his elect, to say that anyone to whom I preach is salvable is not to say that God has made salvation only possible, no, we believe that the purpose of God manifested in the sending of His only begotten Son and the actual saving work of the Son will be efficacious for all whom God has chosen to life and salvation. However, since we do not know the identity of those for whom God has purposed salvation, we must minister to all men with a disposition that truly regards them as salvable. And if that is our disposition, then, number one, we'll be willing to bear all things for their salvation. That's what Paul said in 2 Timothy 2.10. I bear all things for the elect's sake that they may obtain salvation. But I don't know who the elect are, so I'm bearing all things for many non-elect that in that bearing of all things, God may call out his elect to himself. 1 Corinthians 9.22, I have become all things to all men indiscriminately that I may save some, and the some will be God's elect, but Paul treats them all as in a salvable state. And furthermore, we will be constrained to cry to God for their salvation. God never chastised one of his children for praying for a non-elect sinner. Paul said in Romans 10, 11, My heart's desire and prayer for them is that they may be saved. And God will never chastise you. Say, well, you prayed that I'd save people that I didn't choose. No, never, never. You're to be like the God whose heart is open to sinners and then we will make it evident that we have a genuine desire to spend and be spent for their salvation. 1 Thessalonians 2.8, Paul says, We were willing not just to impart the gospel to you, but our very selves. Spurgeon said, When I've spent all my gospel bullets and have none left, I put myself in the gun and I shoot myself at the sinner. That's the kind of spirit that we ought to have. Now, having considered the disposition of the evangelist in relationship to the message he conveys, in relationship to the magnitude of his task, his disposition in relationship to those to whom he preaches, very briefly then, our disposition in relationship to the ultimate success of our task. As week after week, Month after month, we proclaim, we plead, we warn, we entreat. What is to be our disposition with respect to these arduous endeavors and their ultimate fruition? Well, I commend to you those words of our Lord in John 10, 16. Other sheep I have, them also I must bring. Now, how does he bring them? Well, according to Romans 10, 13 to 15, and Ephesians 2, 17, he brings them through the endeavors of his servants. 
Paul could say, He, Christ, came and preached peace to you. Christ never came to Ephesus. Paul did, and his companions. But it was Christ through them, preaching peace. Other sheep I have, I must bring. How does he bring them? He brings them through the instrumentality of his preaching servants. And in 2 Corinthians 2, 4 to 17, we have one of the most beautiful pictures of our gospel endeavors. Paul says, thanks be to God who always leads us to triumph in Christ and makes manifest through us the savor of his knowledge. For we are a sweet savor of Christ unto God in them that are saved, in them that are perished. It's a beautiful picture of the Roman conqueror coming back uh, to the capital city uh, captives chained to his chariot and from his chariot distributing gifts and censers being waved, giving their odors. He says, wherever we go, we preach and God is smelling, <laughs> sniffing. Ah, oh, I smell the fragrance of my son in the preaching of my servant. It smells sweet to me. And he says, as long as God smells the savor of Christ, he's pleased, even though in those who are saved, it's a savor of life to life. And for those who are lost, it's a savor of death to death. He says, we are led in God's triumphal train. And that picture needs to grip our hearts that every Lord's Day when I preach, God sniffing, brethren, and when he smells something of his Son, and his glorious salvation through us. God is pleased, even though in some it's a savor of death unto life, death, while in others a savor of life unto life. What will be the practical fruit of this confidence in the ultimate success of our task? Well, the first is we'll never tamper with the message in order to make it more acceptable to men in their carnal state. If God will make his own message successful and Christ will call his sheep infallibly and certainly, I don't need to tamper with the message to make it more palatable to the unregenerate. I preach the message in its full vigor as God has revealed it. We'll not tamper with the message. 2 Corinthians 2.17, Paul says we did not mess around with the message. We preach the message given. In the second place, we won't be crippled with discouragement when we appear to be unsuccessful. We'll be grieved, we'll be disappointed, and at times brokenhearted. Yet, yet, believing God's purposes are certain to come to pass, we will not allow an apparent lack of success to cripple or to paralyze us. We will remember one sows, another waters, but God gives the increase. And God's been so gracious in this assembly here since I left. There are a number of young adults that I labored for their salvation for years. But bless God, since I've left, God's brought them in and they've been baptized and come into the church and how my heart rejoices. Mine was the privilege of sowing and watering, the privilege of the men who are carrying on the labors to reap. But neither is he that plants anything or waters, but God that gives the increase. So brethren, I set before you these four major aspects of the disposition that must constantly be cultivated as we seek to do the work of an evangelist. A commitment to experience these things will be costly. When these eternal realities constantly run over the wires of your frail humanity, the intensity of the current becomes at times a form of self-immolation. This is something that the apostle had in mind when he said, I am willing to spend, and then an intensified use of that Greek verb, and to be spent out for your sake. And there is a spending out when you lay your heart over the hearts of others, pleading, entreating, begging that they be reconciled to Christ. I close with this simple anecdote. Someone visiting St. Peter's where 
the saintly young Robert McShane preached. And I believe it was a sextant who was there and someone asked them, Sir, you sat under McShane's ministry. What was the secret of his effectiveness in the winning of sinners to Christ? And the man is reported to have answered, He preached as if he were dying to have you converted. He preached as if he were dying to have you converted. Dear men, may God be able to say that of us. We preached as though we are dying that they be converted. This, I believe, is the disposition that under the blessing of God will make us effective in calling out many of those blood-bought sheep. Let's pray together. Our Father, we speak of these things and yet we feel so keenly how far short we come. But Lord, we want to improve and we pray, take us in hand and deal with us in any way necessary that by your grace we may become more and more effective in doing the work of an evangelist in the regular labors of our pastoral ministry. Hear our prayers, we plead. Bless these brethren that must now leave. Take them safely to their homes in joy. And may they know your blessing upon their labors this Lord's Day. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.